Good morning. Welcome to worship. This is the third Sunday of Advent. Today is the, I'm sorry, actually the fourth Sunday of Advent, the Sunday that we celebrate peace, uh, the peace that came down at Christmas. I think for most of us, the idea of peace is kind of part of that aura of Christmas. We have sort of these serene pastoral scenes in our heads of, of a rustic barn where Jesus is born and of shepherds camped out around a campfire with uh, sheep gently bleeding in the, in the background. And then in our modern t- traditions, we, we say that poem, the, the kids are all snug in their beds with visions of sugar plums dancing in their heads. Uh, if there's one time out of the year, it's it's Christmas time that we don't want to be in conflict with anyone else, do we? We want to have that sense of tranquility that that uh, well gives us sort of those warm, fuzzy feelings of Christmas. We're we're after that perfect Christmas. I know uh, that you may have the perfect family with a perfectly decorated home and outside of your home and with perfect gifts for everyone around your tree and um, everybody's maintaining a perfect smile throughout the entire Christmas day. But for the rest of us that aren't that family, <laughs> that family in the catalogs that you see, Christmas can get a little messy. And maybe um, your family can get a little messy. We've, we never quite know what uh, Jackson is going to do at Christmas time, our little differing needs little guy. And he usually eventually likes his gifts, but when we're gathered with extended family or friends, uh, usually it's sort of these awkward moments where either, you know, he doesn't want to open presents or whatever he opens, he could sort of care less about, and eventually he'll, he'll like it. But uh, when you have special needs kids, and some of you know this, you just kind of learn uh, to lay to rest that expectation that everything's going to be perfect, and, and you learn to sort of embrace what happens, and Christy and I are sort of on that journey to just embrace what happens as we move forward. So we'll probably never have that perfect, pristine moment of peace and tranquility, uh, like that family in the commercial where they're all sitting around sipping frothy lattes, and then they run outside, and they're all wearing the exact same pajamas, and they run outside, and there's a a brand new Lexus with a huge bow on it, right? Well, probably we will never be that family. And maybe that's how you feel as well, that no matter how hard you try, Christmas just gets messy. And those perfect moments, no matter how much work you put into it or how much you try to orchestrate, it just sort of falls apart somehow. But let me ask you something. What if we're trying to, to squeeze out of Christmas something that it was never intended to be? What if Christ's coming wasn't about everybody getting along and, and giving you that uh, sentimental tranquility that we're all after? In fact, maybe the reason you so often feel miserable at Christmas or shortly after Christmas is that that you expect Christmas to be something that it's not. What I want to propose to you today is that um, we get peace wrong at Christmas. And in fact, the peace that the angel celebrates when the angels come is is an upside-down peace. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. In fact, I believe that we often diminish the peace that, that Christ brought us by treating it like, like a peace that we can manufacture ourselves. We're about to sing about that episode of the angels when they appear to the shepherds out in the field and declare that God's peace has, has come. And even in singing this song, we're declaring that that peace is not something that we manufactured here on this earth. That peace is a gift that came down from above. And so let's sing that familiar Christmas song. Uh, the chorus says, Gloria in excelsis Deo, which simply means glory to God in the highest. We worship the God who brought down what we could never manufacture ourselves, peace, peace. 
Let's enter into this time of worship and celebrate the God of peace. song we're going to give way to the lighting of the fourth candle of advent the candle of peace we live on the brink uh, every day we stand on the threshold between this world and the next one we live and move between the ordinary and driven between divine the, um, divine between the mundanes mundane mundane and the mystery too after often often we forget to look up and see the angels in our living room we forget that the love we give and live a sign of eternity god is with us right now we forget that company is coming luke tells us that god's favor come to a came to a girl an ordinary girl it might have been your your daughter it might have been the girl down the street or your grandchild but the messenger from god came and greeted her and said the lord is with you what a gift and a promise emmanuel god is with us We light these candles with peace in our hearts. For the promise of primacy, proximity, proximity, the necessaries of God, even when we forget to listen, to lean into that press, present, present God is as close as our own breath this in a confusing 
I mean, confused and confusing world is a peace that has all understanding. It is the peace that knows that company is coming. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Wait. Right Thank you, Northwest Community Church, for having us. Bye. In our household, it's become a little bit of a tradition to watch the movie, The Star. And if you, it's an animated movie about the nativity story. And um, it's just beautiful to see it through the eyes of the animals, of the excitement, all the excitement that was happening around the birth of Jesus. So if I can invite you to come on this journey with me to close your eyes and just imagine what it was like in Bethlehem that night. Just imagine the different scenes and the drama that was evolving with the king and the three wise men and the peace that was happening with the shepherds who were just minding their business and minding their sheep. And then there's a little bit of drama too with Joseph and Mary and the baby's about to come and they can't find a place to lay their heads. So as you join us in singing this beautiful song, A Little Town of Bethlehem, close your eyes and just imagine that night and the beauty that came from that. That is our prayer today, Father. Come and abide in us. Fill
fill us with your Holy Spirit as we come to the end of a year that has tested us like no other. I just pray that every person under the sound of this voice can feel your presence today and your reassurance that you have seen us through the worst. I thank you that you've sustained us with health and strength, that we're still standing, and it is because of your grace and your power and your love. We thank you, Father. We thank you for our jobs and our provision. We thank you for our homes that are our shelter. We thank you that even in the toughest of times and where when relationships are strained, that you can still bring us together and bind us in your powerful love. There is so much to be grateful for this year and this Christmas. There is so much to learn from this year. But today we just want to come to you and say thank you for the best gift of all. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that he came to be born in a manger. Thank you that his story is completely upside down. He's a king and he's born in a little, little town, little town of Bethlehem. We thank you that his life is power in us, that his love is also power through us, Father. And May we take that this Christmas and share it with people around us, with our neighbors, with our family, with people that we don't even know, that we can spread that love just like you have given it to us freely. We love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We've lit the four candles of Advent. We're singing the Christmas songs. Um, what a wonderful time of year. And I hope that uh, you're enjoying the service today. Uh, today we're going to continue our uh, sermon series, Christmas Upside Down. Before we do, let me share with you the birthdays that are coming up uh, from now till the end of the year. James Miller, James and Caitlin were with us up until uh, several months ago. James's birthday is December 21st. Happy birthday, James. Uh, Titan Radney, uh, the Radney family moved down to the Orlando area, but Titan's birthday is on December 23rd. And my brother, Andy Turner, was born on Christmas Day. Yes, he interrupted our G.I. Joe toys that we were putting together back in, well, I won't tell you the year, just in case he doesn't want you to know that. But Andy, uh, his birthday is the 25th. Happy birthday, little brother. Uh, Amerle Gaudry, will, is, her birthday is coming up on the 28th of December. Happy birthday, Amerle. And those are your birthdays for today. Kids, uh, if you watch the uh, lesson videos during service, you can go ahead and tune in on YouTube to the lesson today about uh, the birth of Jesus and see Miss Dianca there. Today, the, um, we weren't able to get a craft, physical craft project out to you, but there's several downloadable sheets. So parents, if you can uh, print those sheets out so they can have some projects to do, then they'll be all ready and set for today. Let's jump into this series as we uh, get closer to Christmas Eve service that will happen uh, on Wednesday night, where we'll wrap up this series. But today we're continuing it. Today we're talking about an upside down peace, and we're going to be looking at Luke, the second chapter, uh, looking at the episode of the, of the Shepherds. By the way, we will be sharing communion together, uh, so if you haven't already done so, go ahead and grab some elements, uh, some sort of beverage, and uh, crackers or bread, and we'll share that at the end of the service today. So we've talked about in this series about how just about every detail of the Christmas story just kind of seems upside down from what we would have expected but we've been reminded also that when things uh, seem upside down, that that is when God does some of his best work. 
Let's read um, Luke, the second chapter. We're going to be reading verses 8 through 14 and then skip down at the episode of Simeon beginning at verse 28. Let's read together. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Let's skip down to verse 28. And Simeon took Jesus, took him in his arms, and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Such a, such a key word, your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him, and then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Very ominous words upon the meeting of an infant child. That's the word of God. So here's what's bothered me about this text, and so now I'll let it bother you, is is this tension that the angels proclaim that peace has come. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Uh, But then Luke writes just 20 verses later, if you're doing the math, that uh, Simon Simeon says this child is destined to ruin some and to elevate others. That his coming will resort, uh, result in a sword piercing the heart of his mother. And so, so which is it? Does Jesus bring peace or does he bring this conflict that Simeon talks about? And like most things that we've talked about in this series, what we're going to find is that the peace that Jesus does bring in his coming is, is an upside down peace from what Uh, we think and what they thought back when Jesus was born. What we'll see in a moment is that Jesus' coming did indeed bring both peace and conflict. And so I want to share just two things about this peace and why it's upside down. First of all, it's upside down because it's an offensive peace, an offensive peace. And doesn't that sort of sound like an oxymoron, an offensive peace? And here's... um, why it's offensive and here's why it feels so upside down is because before you can find the peace of God the peace of Christ in your life you're going to have to get to the place where you're offended by who Christ is first Peter 2 8 says that Jesus was the rock that causes us to stumble that Uh, He's the rock that at some point we're all going to encounter and we're going to stumble over him because we have a choice to make in who he is. There's no getting around him. And so we just read the accounts of the angels, but let's fast forward about 33 years to the moment when Jesus enters Jerusalem uh, just days before his crucifixion. And so I want to read Luke, the 19th chapter in verses 41 to 42. This is the account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. So we went sort of from the beginning to near the end of the story that the life of Christ that held so much promise for Israel was, for the most part, rejected. John would write in in his version of the nativity that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but then he says that he came to those that were his own, but his own rejected him. 
And so why did they reject this peace that the shepherds proclaimed had come? It's, this is supposed to be uh, good news. So why was this peace so unwanted? Well, the answer lies in their expectations. They were expecting something different, that God was going to send a promised one that would, that would result in a peace that they were all longing for, a political peace, a social peace. That a mighty warrior would emerge and would unite Israel and lead the nation into this new golden era. And uh, they would be free from this brutal reign of Rome that they have been suffering under for so long. That's what God's peace was supposed to look like in the minds of Israel. That was the expectation. So when it came down to their relationship with God, there was no sense that they needed someone to save their soul. They rather needed someone to save their country and to save their way of life, to save them from diseases and from poverty. As we've been talking about throughout this series, so much seemed wrong or upside down about Jesus, his hometown, his lineage, his distance from the religious elite. It was all upside down. And that's why the religious leaders asked him over and over again, Jesus, by what authority are you doing all of these things or saying all of these things? So instead of receiving the peace, his, his own people rejected the peace that Jesus brought. Peace, the real peace, was within their grasp, but they miss it because they didn't think that they needed the kind of peace that Jesus was bringing. They, in fact, were so offended by the peace that Jesus brought, the peace that they didn't think that they needed, that they would hang him on a tree and crucify him in the ultimate rejection of that peace. But let's go back to Luke, the second chapter, back to the angels proclaiming peace. And there's an important phrase that follows that declaration of peace. And if you're like me, I learned this passage in the uh, King James Version, and I hear it every year. Linus recites it on the Charlie Brown Christmas special, and it's a little bit different than the translation we read a moment ago. The NIV translation says that there is peace to men on whom his favor rests. Peace to men on whom his favor rests. And other modern translations, like the English Standard Version, says, uh, on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. So what difference does it make? Well, it actually makes a big difference. It means that the, the promise of peace on that first Christmas wasn't about God uh, sort of taking this big comfy blanket of peace and tossing it over the entire world and, and, and saying, let me just keep you warm with my peace. It, in fact, was about God reaching down to his chosen people of Israel with the fulfillment of the covenant that had been waited for for so long, that the Messiah had finally come to bring in full view this relationship with God. In other words, this peace that the angels brought was, was about settling the score between uh, Israel and God, that finally things were going to be made right. And it was good news of great joy, but... For all people, but in this moment, the angel proclaims that final fulfillment for this long journey of the people of God as they finally find peace with God. Friends, before Christ can save us with his peace, he first has to offend us. You know, our self-sufficient, I don't need a savior way of life has to be offended Whatever expectations we have, have to be offended. And then when Christ confronts us, we have a choice to make. Do I, do I need his peace? And if so, am I willing to humble myself and receive his peace? And only after that conflict and deciding whether you'll follow Jesus, only after you're confronted and, and offended with who he was, only then after that decision can you truly discover peace. And so it is a very different peace than I think most of us hear when we read that passage. You know, it doesn't just offend us, though. The, the Gospels tell us that it's also going to offend others. 
And this is where the tension lies for me, and I'm sure for you as you hear these uh, passages, that Jesus came to bring peace, but it's obvious that there was something else going on here. And I think um, the other way to view the coming of Christ is to, is to view it as a declaration of war on the power of sin on this earth, that, that the enemy of God, Satan, had been uh, the bully on the playground for long enough, and finally God comes in human form, and the gig's up <laughs> for the enemy. And so it's a declaration of war, and that's why you see these forces begin moving as Herod uh, tries to rid Israel of all of the, uh, the, the child males trying to destroy this new king that's come. And in Luke, it's Simeon who predicts that when Jesus is just eight days old, he says that because of this child, uh, many will fall and others will be elevated just because he came. He goes on to say that people will speak out and declare their opposition to his coming. And finally, he says that his own mother would have her, her soul pierced, her heart pierced because of Jesus' coming. That doesn't sound like a nice, sentimental kind of peace that we celebrate at Christmas, does it? In fact, Scripture shows us that his coming is going to be offensive to other people as well, just as it's offensive to us and so just 10 chapters later, Luke will record these words of Jesus. Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 51, when Jesus said this, Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? Question mark. No, I tell you, but division. And so there's this tension that Jesus comes to bring peace, but that's a peace that's also going to bring conflicts. He goes on to describe how our loyalty to follow Jesus can cause deep divisions within families. Simeon predicted that the thoughts of many hearts would be revealed, meaning that Jesus will cause us to, to come out of our corner and declare whether we're for Jesus or against Jesus. There is no middle ground. Jesus, in essence, um, is saying to us, I own you, and, and those are fighting words right there. I own you, and you're gonna, are you going to submit to me and let me lead your life, or are you going to reject my ownership of your life? And so the peace that we receive brings some new conflicts with it as we accept the peace of Christ. I think most of the world wants Christmas to be a moment of peace, even in our country that's so divided right now, we would love to see you know, everyone come together and, and celebrate Christmas. We'd love to see people you know, lay down their weapons and their, their words and the comment sections on these websites. Just lay it down and have some, some moments of peace. And those are good things that we, we want to see that peace happen on Christmas. But this text is talking about a different sort of peace. It's talking about a peace between us and between God. And the angels can proclaim that peace has come to this earth because it has come. And it, it, the peace's name is Jesus, a peace between us and God. Paul writes in Ephesians, the second chapter in verse 14, that Jesus himself is our peace. Your peace has a name and his name is Jesus. Our natural state is to live as the enemy of God, but Jesus came to end the war. He came to reconcile us to the Father. It's not the peace that most people necessarily want at Christmas time, but it's the peace that we most need at Christmas time. Well, the second thing I want to tell you about this upside down peace is that it's uh, not just offensive, but it's also a contagious sort of peace. So ultimately, the, the goal of the peace that we've been given is to bring about peace in our world, but it happens in sort of an upside down way, and that's what I want to talk about before we close today. You know, we, we try to capture that peace in our Christmas songs. We, we want that feeling of peace that's on the front of our Christmas cards, and God wants that for us as well. It's been estimated that... Uh, 
only 8% of recorded history has been peacetime. Well, that's kind of mind-blowing, isn't it? 8% of recorded history has been in peacetime. And over the last 3,000 years, only 300 of those years have been without war of some type. And over 8,000 treaties have been broken between countries. And then there's that uh, story that's been made into movies, and you've probably heard the story of World War I, the Christmas truce, and it was on December 24th, 1914. And it seems to have begun, begun with the German troops. It's on Christmas Eve, and the troops on both sides have decorated their trenches, and suddenly somebody on the German side starts singing Silent Night in German, and the British troops respond by singing, Oh, come all ye faithful. And so during that Christmas, over 500 miles of the Western Front were silent. In fact, uh, historians have found letters and interviewed soldiers who said that they even got out and played an impromptu game of soccer in the no man's land between the trenches on both sides. Some soldiers even reported exchanging gifts with those from the other side. Uh, there, <laughs> we're told that the British commander was absolutely furious about this whole episode and, and said it would never happen again. But for those few hours, this horrendous fighting stopped. For those few hours, the coming of the Savior made us put down our weapons and interact as, as fellow human beings. Sometimes we see Christmas as just a holiday and maybe kind of a, a break from reality. And so we think these, these feelings of unity are kind of superficial. But I want to suggest uh, that, that we should see Christmas peace not just as a short break from reality, not as a short truce before we go back to our trenches and start fighting again, but rather we see that as, as the goal of our life every day that we're pursuing peace with each other. So let me circle back. Because peace in our world and peace with each other is a good thing that God does desire. Remember, uh, Jesus does say, blessed are the peacemakers. But, but let me show you the beauty and the power of true Christmas peace. True peace tells you that, that you don't deserve it, that, that peace with God is a gift that's come down, that you were at odds with God until he reached out and offered you that gift of peace. And so we know we don't deserve it, so we have no reason to look down on other people because we know that we don't deserve it either. We have no reason to fight and to pick at people who are different than we are because we are all sinners in need of a Savior. And if we could all possess the, the humility that is at the core of a relationship with God, then this world would be a more peaceful place. That as the prophet says, the, the lion would lay down with the lamb. We wouldn't have the divisions that occur when one group looks down at the other. The, the gospel of Jesus is the great leveler in our world. It, it flattens us and makes us all realize our need of God. And so finding peace with God through Jesus can lead to a powerful peace in our world, a, a peace that shows itself in our relationship, a peace that shows itself in our politics, a peace that shows itself even within our own spirits. Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 9 and 6 that, that this child that was going to be born would be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, but he also said that this child would be called the prince of peace. And there's an element of ruling power in that description, isn't there? That it's not just that Jesus would be peaceful, but that he would be the king that brings about peace in his kingdom. And that's exactly what he came to do. In the early church, the lack of peace was between the Jews and the Gentiles. And Paul uh, wrote about their differences and trying to get them to reconcile. And he said this in Ephesians, the second chapter, that that Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. In other words, Jesus came to bring peace. 
to the Jews, to the Gentiles, and to us. <laughs> Democrat, Republican, black, white, male, female, old, young. You know, this Christmas time, um, there's a lot of tension. We're all under a, a lot of stress. We're all trying to wrestle with how we celebrate Christmas and who we gather with and do we travel. And, and maybe you've had to have some hard conversations with family members. And so there's just a, a, a lot of landmines this Christmas season, aren't there? But Christmas is also a wonderful time to pursue peace with each other. It's a, it's a chance to make a fresh start with that family member that maybe you've been distant from. It's, it's a chance to make a fresh start in your marriage that's maybe been in, tr- in trouble. It's a chance to reconcile with a co-worker. And, and you can pursue peace with those around you because, and here's the power of Christmas peace, you can pursue peace in those relationships because you have received God's peace. And his name is Jesus. We've been having uh, a challenge each week of Advent, and this week we're going to challenge you to spread peace around you by practicing some random acts of kindness. Uh, In fact, we'd love to hear if if you're practicing a random act of kindness this week, we'd love to hear about it on our social media page. Um, Text us, uh, post it on Facebook. We'd love to hear about it. Uh, Maybe you pay for uh, the car's meal behind you. Somebody did that for me uh, one day, and it was hugely impactful, just a a small free gift. Uh, This week, look for ways just to practice some random acts of kindness to increase the the peace around you, to, to see the peace of God's kingdom come. So I want to go back to that image that we talked about just a few moments ago when Jesus comes and he looks over Jerusalem and he's weeping and he knows that they have had this misdirected search for peace and he's weeping because they've missed it and he knows they've already missed it. And I can't help but wonder if he doesn't weep for us that we have this beautiful opportunity at Christmas when we celebrate his birth to not miss him. But many of us are going to get distracted with with all of these different pieces of Christmas and we're going to miss it yet again. And it's going to be another missed opportunity and I can't help but, but think that it makes the heart of Christ sad. This year... My prayer is that you celebrate the the true peace of God, the peace of God that that you've wrestled with and you've confronted Jesus and who he is and you've asked him to lead your life and now that peace of Christ rules in your heart. How many disappointments you would be spared in life if you realized that Jesus said in this world, uh, we will have trouble But Jesus has come to help us overcome this world, and his peace is going to help you overcome. So if you want to have a a lasting peace, both on Christmas and after Christmas, then grab a hold of the peace that is Christ and start living out that peace in your circle of relationships around you. And in fact, we don't even have to wait till Christmas to celebrate his peace. We're going to celebrate it in just a few minutes as we come to the table. And, and we're going to move into that uh, out of words and into the drama of his peace that came when he came and hung on a cross and died for our sins. And that gift of peace is in every sense a free gift offered to you even though we didn't deserve it. Prepare uh, your elements in just a few minutes, and then uh, we'll come to this table. But let's pray. God, we are thankful that this peace we celebrate on Christmas isn't a superficial feeling, but is a restoration if we will receive it. That you have come to restore us to our Creator. And so this year, God, I pray that the peace of Christmas would would infiltrate every part of us, and not just every part of us, but would infiltrate every relationship, every family, every relationship between a parent and child and husband and wife and friendships. 
And that, God, this year we would grasp and understand the power of the peace that we have access to because you came. And yes, it seems upside down that, that your peace would come and, and cause us to be offended and others to be offended and cause conflict. But God, we see your ultimate goal and it's beautiful and it's powerful. And we want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of your kingdom of peace. God, as we prepare to approach 2021, we just commit our hearts to, to be people of peace to take the peace that we've been given and to share that with others. And God, I just pray that you'd prepare our hearts in the next few moments as we come to your table and we're reminded of the cost that was paid for the peace that we're able to enjoy. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. That was fun. Thank you, worship team. If you have your elements out, let's prepare to receive communion at this time. As we come to this table, again, we come to celebrate uh, the cost that was paid for the peace that we're able to experience uh, here at Christmas time. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we pray that your spirit would fall on these gifts of the bread and the cup that we're all sharing wherever we're at today. God, we pray that... Uh, that you would transcend time and space and that you would bind us together during this time as we come to your table. God, I pray that even as uh, 
This bread is nourishment for our souls. I pray, God, that we uh, can partake and go out and nourish a world that is hungry, that is walking in darkness and desperate for light and life. And now, uh, friends, will you pray this prayer that the Lord taught us to pray together, saying these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On the night before Christ was crucified, he took the bread, and after he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, and after he blessed it and gave thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink of this cup, and every time you do, remember me. Friends, let's celebrate the price that was paid for our peace today as we taste and see that the Lord is good. The body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. And you can partake those elements now. It's always a joy to come to the Lord's table, even virtually. It's just a reminder that we're all in this together. And uh, I want to share with you a few announcements as we get very close to the end of the year. It's so hard to believe that I'm saying that. (laughs) Wow, 2020 is almost over. Uh, This Sunday, we lit the candle of peace. And so we've been having an Advent photo challenge And we would love for you to take a picture of something in uh, your home or um, anywhere that you're at that represents peace to you and just post it on your uh, Facebook page with a hashtag, uh, hashtag NWAdventChallenge, NWAdventChallenge, and then we can search and find that. Again, uh, pictures of things that remind you of peace. Uh, Today we actually have our talent show that's going to be airing right after this worship service. And so this live stream is going to end in just a couple of minutes. And after that, uh, we have another premiere scheduled for the next uh, live stream that's going to be our talent show. And so thanks for all of those that submitted videos, and I hope that you enjoy that time. But it's going to be immediately after this live stream today. Uh, Christmas Eve is almost here, and we are recording just a a short 30-minute Christmas Eve service that you can tune into anytime on Christmas Eve and uh, be reminded about the meaning of Christmas and see some of the things that I know we all enjoy doing together, traditionally lighting our candles and uh, singing uh, Silent Night and Joy to the World, some of those traditions that uh, I enjoy and I know many of you do as well. So tune in uh, beginning at 10 o'clock on Christmas Eve, and you can watch that service anytime throughout the day on Christmas Eve. Again, it'll be short, but uh, designed with the whole family in mind. Also just want to say thanks to all of those that made our week of giving uh, just a wonderful, rich week and a successful week. We uh, were able to give gifts to, uh, I think it was nine or ten different families in the Young Lives Ministry, the Ministry for Single Moms. Um, I was able to come out and play Santa Claus and have take some socially distant pictures with the families. A lot of fun. Our, our members were so generous in their gifts. Thank you to all those that participated. And also during that time, we had people give um, close to $700 uh, towards Young Lives in financial gifts. Thank you for that. And uh, several of you also brought by food for the food bank. And we have a big pile of it here at the church that we're going to be delivering to the local food bank. So thank you for all of your generosity during that week of giving here during the season of Advent. We normally do not have a service on December 27th, but this year we're going to re-air a service that played uh, actually about a, a, a year ago, and it was in the series called Mastermind, and the sermon is on the topic of, of an audit of your mind and letting God be the master of your mind. And so in looking at some of the services throughout the last year, it seemed uh, like a great time to go back and take a look at that topic, and we're going to be talking in that sermon all about 
um, looking at the, the thought patterns that you've fallen into, and I think all of us are trying to stay positive during this time, but I think it's going to be a much needed reminder about how God can really help us to transform our minds, and if he can transform our minds, he can transform our lives. Thanks again for joining us today for this fourth Sunday of Advent, and we hope that you've enjoyed the worship service. Don't forget the uh, virtual talent show right after this. I pray that you and your family have a wonderful Christmas time together. I pray safety for those that will be traveling and safety around all of you uh, in regards to this virus. Have a wonderful rest of the week. God bless you and Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm.